Good morning. And welcome to our service this morning. Notices. Margaret has something to say to us. So come forward, Margaret. Morning, everybody. Morning. You know, yesterday was our, our summer sale, and I want to thank all the helpers and everybody that brought along donations. And for all, it wasn't very well I attended. We made £590 for church funds. Thank you. And also, I've been asked to give you this notice. I've also put it in the, in the lobby, uh, and you can see it at your leisure. There will be a memorial service for Ben Miller, who died last summer. Ben was Alistair Miller and Gillian Little's son, and the service will be on Saturday, the 4th of May. That's uh, this Saturday coming at 2 o'clock at St. James the Less Church. All are welcome to it. Let's pause for a moment as we come to worship God. Please join with me in our call to worship. It's from words based on 1 Peter chapter 2. Look, God has set up in Zion a chosen precious cornerstone. Believe in him, you'll not be ashamed. We come to him, the Lord Jesus, that living stone. People rejected him, but he is the one God chose, and he is of great value. Let's sing together about God's goodness. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us cheered us on our way. Let us come to God in prayer. Father, we want to witness to your love, to share with others what you've done for us in Jesus, and to reflect something of your love through who we are. But we don't always know how or where or when. We're nervous about it. We're tongue-tied. We're uncertain of what to say and afraid of sounding hollow and bogus, afraid of doing more harm than good. And so we confess we often clam up and fail you in this. We tell you about these and other failures quietly now. Father, Forgive us and speak to us again through your Holy Spirit. Teach us that it's not the cleverness of our words that has the power to change lives, but the message of your love in Jesus, the wonder of that amazing generosity and grace, that in Jesus you took our place, that he laid down his life to set us free. We want to sing of that today and in our daily lives, a witness offered to you from the heart, a genuine expression of all that you mean to us. Help us to trust in you, our shepherd, to lead us in the right way, and give us the words to say when we need them. Save us from evading your challenge, and help us openly and honestly to speak for you and live to your glory. Come to us now in our worship and speak to all of us through what is said today and help us to play our part in our community in and through Jesus on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. Amen. Jesus was one day teaching in the temple courts. And the Bible experts and the chief priests who actually wanted to kill him, to get rid of him, were listening to him. And he tells them this story, which Ian is going to read to us later. It's a story about a vineyard. 
Now, his stories that Jesus told mean much more than they say. Can you work out who this story is about? There was a man who owned and planted a vineyard. That's a place where they plant and grow grapes. And he rented the vineyard out to some tenant farmers and he thought they would look after it for him and give him his share of the grapes. Now, when harvest time came, the man sent servant number one to collect his fruit. But when the tenants saw him, they beat him up and he left without any grapes. Then he sent another servant, servant number two, and the tenants treated him exactly the same way. He sent a third servant, and they hurt him badly and threw him out. Now the man then does a strange thing. The man thinks about it, and he decides to send his one and only son to the tenants, his son whom he dearly loves. And he says, perhaps they'll respect my son. And so the son goes off. But when the bad tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, look, here's the heir. Let's kill him. And then the vineyard, the whole inheritance, will be ours. And so they attacked the vineyard owner's son, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, if you imagine Jesus turning to his listeners and saying what he actually said, what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? Well, I'll ask you, because you're listening to the story, I hope. So what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? I don't know. <laughs> well, Martin, at least you're honest. <laughs> and you're brave to speak out. Well, Jesus says he'll rub those tenants out and he'll rent his vineyard out to other people. But when the people heard this, what they actually say is, oh, oh no, that, no, no, that must never happen. God forbid that it happens. Why do you think they said that? Someone else, maybe apart from Martin. Well, I'll tell you why. Because they all knew a famous story from their Bible about a vineyard, God's vineyard. It was a story that the prophet Isaiah had told the people. And the vineyard, he also said, was them. The vineyard was the people of Israel and Judah. And that's why they said, no, 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 this must never happen. But what God was looking for in the story that Isaiah told was fruit from his vineyard. But in Isaiah's time, all he got was sour grapes and bloodshed instead of the people reflecting God's justice and mercy to the world. So Jesus said to those who were hearing him, have you never read in the scriptures, there's a song of Isaiah's vineyard, have you never read in the scriptures, that's from Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
And the builders of Israel was the name that was given at that time to those who were the religious leaders. And Jesus actually says in Matthew's account, Luke's account is more circumspect because he's actually a Gentile. But in Matthew's account, he says what Jesus says straight. God's kingdom will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruits. And I don't think that's confined to the people of Jesus' day. God's kingdom. God is expecting fruit from the people he's given his precious inheritance to. God is expecting. I have chosen you that you will bear much fruit, Jesus says to the disciples in John's Gospel. And he goes on to say, and this is a strange kind of thing to understand, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus is the cornerstone of God's new building. It's composed of of Jews and non-Jews. It's composed of men and women. It's composed of people who are high up in society and people who occupy the lowliest position in that society who are slaves. It's composed of people out there who talk funny and people who think they talk properly. Barbarians and people who think they're civilized. And Jesus is the one by whom all people will be judged. That's the teaching of the New Testament. And that's, I think, what Jesus is saying here. Now, the chief priests had twigged quite early on. They knew that Jesus was talking about them. And they looked for a way to arrest Jesus but they didn't at that time because they were afraid because of all the people who heard him gladly. I wonder if that's how we think about Jesus as not just something to listen to on a Sunday, but of Jesus being the center of God's plan, not only for us, but for the whole world, potentially. And we're going to think about that later in the service. But now we're going to sing. And we're going to sing Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. The readings are from Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12, a reading from the New English translation of the Bible, and Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19 from the New International Version. Acts chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today for a good deed done to a sick man, by what means this man was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man stands before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, that has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. And then from Luke chapter 20. Jesus went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant 
to the tenants so that they could give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw, saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who call, falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way of arresting him immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this is a, a difficult part of Scripture, not because it's difficult in itself, but it's difficult in our society today. So we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to us. Send your Holy Spirit to me that I may speak convincingly and humbly and powerfully because of your word. And send your Holy Spirit to all of us because no doubt some of us have questions about this and some of us have doubts. So come to all of us. Speak to us powerfully through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We've looked at Jesus' teaching that lies behind Peter's claim to the Sanhedrin. That's the chief priests and the elders of the people. That Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and has become the cornerstone. Additionally, we can think that in Aramaic and in Hebrew, the word for, for stone is eben, and the word for son is ben. So you see the connection between what Jesus is saying. But I'd like you now to turn your attention to Peter's last statement. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. In other words, salvation is only offered to everybody in the world through Jesus. This statement was controversial in Peter's time. Why? Well, because in the first place, the Sanhedrin are trying to stop any mention of Jesus. That becomes clear later on in the chapter. And furthermore, every Jewish people person would think at that time that to have any hope of salvation, you have to become a Jew. Even Peter isn't fully aware of the full meaning of his assertion at this point. If you don't believe me, you can read the following chapters in Acts. And in time, the Roman Empire is going to see Christians standing up and claiming allegiance to Jesus alone as a threat to imperial unity. And they're going to say, you can worship whoever you like. You can worship Jesus if you want. But you must follow the state religion as well. Remember, 
a pinch of incense to the genius of the emperor. And Christians are going to have to say no. This statement is also controversial in our time. Why? Because of secular pluralism in modern thinking. Now, some aspects of pluralism are good. It sustains a, a democratic, multicultural society in which everyone is deemed worthy of respect and everyone has freedom of conscience to worship and think for themselves. I'm not going to argue against any of that because these things are all derived from Christian values and biblical ideas. And it would be much, much worse if we lived in an authoritarian society where everything that we thought and believed was, was said from the top down. An autocracy, in other words. However, some aspects of modern pluralism are less good. In late modern societies, people tend to think or say that to maintain peace and harmony, you mustn't make universal truth claims. The idea is that all religious truth is relative to the culture in which you're brought up. And it's okay to hold it in private life, but it's not appropriate to speak about it in public. In other words, you mustn't say that Jesus is the only Savior, the only name given among people by which we must be saved, because that would be an obstacle to people living in peace and unity. Now, I agree that people, and I hope you agree too, that people living in peace is a social good. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But how do you maintain your commitment to Jesus to speak out for him publicly as he asks? Remember, we were looking at it a few weeks ago in Mark's gospel. He said that anyone who is ashamed of me and my words. In that day, I will be ashamed of him. The Son of Man will be ashamed of him. Now, we're going to come back to that problem later. Let's, first of all, look at what the New Testament is not saying. It's not saying about other religions. It's not saying there's no wisdom in other religions. Even in the Old Testament, there's evidence that in the wisdom books of the Old Testament, the compilers of Proverbs drew on other religious traditions for their practical insights, changing some of them where it clashed with their own convictions. It's not denying common ground in some practices and beliefs. And I'm talking here about non-Christian religions. And in some of the things other religions say about the human condition. I'm going to give you an example of that. The Apostle Paul on trial at the high court of the Areopagus in Athens in Acts chapter 17 quotes approvingly from two pagan authors. He's telling the people that God is not far from any one of us. For he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And he's quoting Epimenides there, who's a pagan philosopher. And he goes on to say, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And there he's quoting Aratus. And then he goes on to say to them what this God is like and what he's doing in Jesus. 
in the first chapter of Romans, he also says that all people have some knowledge of God. The trouble is that they haven't followed it. And it's possible he means that they haven't been able to follow what they know. They're culpable on the one hand, but they're in a predicament on the other. And the last thing I want to say is from the notable Japanese Christian, Toyohiko Kagawa, and he said this. And I find this in John Stott's book, The Incomparable Christ. Kagawa said, I am grateful for Shinto, for Buddhism, and for Confucianism. I owe much to these faiths. The fact that I was born with a spirit of reverence, that I have an insatiable craving for values which transcend this earthly life, and that I strive to walk the way of the golden mean. That means to avoid extremes. I owe entirely to the influence of these ethnic faiths. And yet, yet, he says, yet these three faiths utterly failed to minister to my heart's deepest need. I was a pilgrim journeying upon a long, long road that had no turning. I was weary. I was footsore. I wandered through a dark and dismal world where tragedies were thick, tears were my meat, day and night. Buddhism, he says, teaches great compassion. But since the beginning of time, who has declared, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sin? You recognize the words, perhaps, from words which we repeat at, at every service of the Lord's Supper, at every Holy Communion. And I think that's the same for all churches. This is my blood, said Jesus, of the new covenant that's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So, that's what the New Testament is not saying. Let's look now at what the New Testament actually is saying. That God's initiative in Jesus is the only way to salvation, the only way that we can be saved. He's not principally talking about something we do. They're talking about something that God does. That God calls all people now to respond in repentance and faith to Jesus. Because this good news, and that's significant, this gospel is not primarily about what we've done or can do. It's about what God has done for us in Jesus in history. You know, the great truths of the gospel are not philosophies to be explored and followed. They're announcements of what God has done. God became a human being and lived among us so that he could take our sins upon himself in Jesus because he loved us and did not want to be parted from us. Jesus rose again so that he could bring us into right relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God pours out his Holy Spirit on those who respond with belief in Jesus. And if you read the early Christian creeds, why don't you take time to read the Nicene Creed this afternoon? You'll see the announcement of this same storyline. 
It's good news for a weary world. In another of Jesus' stories of his parables, he says, or the the man who's preparing a great party for everyone says, come, for all things are now ready. And he sends his servants out further and further to gather in those who will come in. What is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? It's first and foremost God's mission to rescue human beings from a predicament that we can't get out of by ourselves. It's being rescued from sin and that final separation from God, that eternal death that is the payload that sin brings with it. We're not only forgiven, we're changed by the Holy Spirit coming to live with us. and We're allowed to share in God's goodness, to have a partnership, to have fellowship with the living God. But it's so much bigger than that. Someone was telling me about Andrew Ollerton who works for the Bible Society in England. He's also an academic. And this is his picture of salvation. And you can see it's Russian dolls that that get bigger and fit inside each other. Salvation has personal, social, and cosmic dimensions. The personal good news is that I am forgiven through Jesus. But you have to accept that. You have to believe in Jesus as the only Savior. And it has social connotations as well. We're not only reconciled to God now as our Father, we're reconciled to each other. All these people that I spoke about with all their cultural differences are reconciled in Jesus, in the body of Christ. And it has cosmic dimensions. One day God is going to make all things new. We're already a new creation in Jesus. But God is going to do that for the whole cosmos. And I could speak about that for ages, but don't worry, I'm on the last paragraph now. So how should we proclaim this truth? Because it is a truth to be announced, to be proclaimed, rather than an argument between religions. In the first place, We should do it with humility. It's not about us, it's about God's grace in us. Think of Peter before the Sanhedrin. They're amazed at him. He's unabashed by them. Imagine standing up before the, uh, the highest court in the land and not trembling in your boots. Timothy Keller says that in that society, he should have been looking at his feet. He should have been shuffling about. But notice he's not talking down to them either. He has courage, boldness, not rudeness, in the Holy Spirit, and a new identity in Jesus, a new identity in the Messiah. I've been reading Timothy Keller and John Stott on this topic. If you ask me about my sources afterwards, I'll I'll tell you. But just to say quickly, it's not about forcing people to believe the gospel. And it's not about being indifferent to their response either. 
It's not about saying, oh, well, you go this way, I'll, we'll go this way. It's about interacting with your fellow human beings and seeking to persuade people gently with the Holy Spirit's help of all that God has done for us in Jesus, in the Messiah, his Son. I'm sorry for having kept you for a long time. Let's pray. Father, today we, we gave out the Try Praying booklets, which are an opportunity for people to discover for themselves something about Jesus, because you're not far from any one of us and an opportunity for, for future conversations and interactions with your people. Help us, prompt us by your Holy Spirit, and empower us to do these things for the sake and for the name of Jesus, in whom alone is salvation. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, as we bring our prayers to you, we ask you to receive our gifts of money given in various ways and to use them to carry out the mission of your church locally and in the wider world. We thank you that you are a God of abundance and grace and that in your love you reach out to every single one of us, your children. But we live in a world that often fails to reflect that truth. So today we remember people who are persecuted for their sexuality, gender, faith or convictions. That they will not just be tolerated in the society they live in, but fully accepted and treated with the respect they deserve. We pray too for those who live under the shadow of violence or are threatened by war or destruction. We ask you to bring peace where we have got involved in war and where people have lost their homes or livelihoods or are living in danger every day, we pray for your protection and comfort. We bring before you anyone with serious financial worries people living under the daily strain of debt, poverty or homelessness. And we pray that their immediate needs will be met and that they will also be able to get their finances back onto a sound footing in the long term. We pray for anyone experiencing personal or emotional problems, people who have been bereaved, people who are estranged from their families and communities and everyone who feels as though they just can't cope. We ask you to bring them that peace and comfort that nobody else can. Father God, thank you that you want to bless us and that you can help us and want to help us when we're not able to help ourselves. So in a few moments of silence, we bring to you anyone we know about who particularly needs your help at this time. And Lord, we also pray for ourselves, a small community in a small town, but part of your body worldwide with its over two billion sisters and brothers, all part of the one global family under you. Help us to place our lives in your hands and to be ready to be used by you anywhere, anytime and with anyone. Today we thank you again, especially for the Try Praying booklets, which give us a way to connect with people naturally as we respond in conversations with them. Help us to remember that in everything we do for you, 
you go with us and you make us able to do any number of things we just can't do in our own strength. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to sing the piece of music which we had before, the song we had at the beginning. Um, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul. Here again, what Christ's apostle John says. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you've done in Jesus. We thank you that you also know all about us, even more than we know about ourselves. But we come before you and we confess our faults and our frailty. Show us that in Jesus we're forgiven so that we may carry his message of forgiveness to everyone else. Touch the places we feel wounded with your healing so that we be, may we be your people who bring your healing to others and help us to be at peace with ourselves to have that new identity in Christ which Peter knew and to speak out boldly without rudeness, without lording it over other people and so that we might become makers of your peace for others. And all this through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. So now we do as Jesus himself commanded us to do. We take this bread and wine, the ordinary things of the world, which Christ in his own way will make special to us. And as he prayed before sharing, let's also pray. Praise be to you, our Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. He lived and died for love of us, and after rising from the dead, he wonderfully met with his disciples. He ascended into heaven, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is with us now. And that's why we join with the saints and angels, echoing your praise throughout the world and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And as we remember his death on the cross, his sacrifice made once for all to save us, we rejoice in his living presence. Send your Holy Spirit to us that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unite us with him and with all God's people in heaven and on earth. Let's join together in the family prayer of the church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, the Apostle Paul says we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We take this wine to share in the blood of Christ. We believe that he who lived, died, and rose again for us will meet us here. Jesus said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this to remember me. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood a new relationship made possible with God, made possible because of my death. Drink, it all, drink from it, all of you, to remember me. Has everyone got the bread? His body broken for you. Has everyone received his blood shed for you? And now we'll share the peace. The peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen. Our final song today is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Zion City of Our God. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.